Hey, my name is Nikki and I'm coming you, to you from my library again today. I'm going to record a video for uh, AuthorTube which I've just discovered this morning. So while I was here I thought I'd also record my end of the month book review for you too. It's a few days before the end of the month, however the only book I haven't finished yet that I will finish before that time is a non-fiction and I already pretty much know what I'm going to award it. I'm three quarters through. It's not like I've got to wait for an ending or anything like that as it is with a fiction book. So I figured I would just um, go ahead and do the review. Uh, I won't finish anything else now before next week. So, okay, where to start this month? Um, I only have one book that I read that's a paperback, which I've left in the other room typically, so I can't wave it at you, but uh, it's called Anno Dracula. And, um, it is, uh, it's written by Kim Newman. Um, for this book I'd like to give a shout out to my friend Sarah, um, who sent it to me. It's one she's read and liked but didn't want to keep, so she passed it on to me for free. So um, I wouldn't have got to read it otherwise, which was lovely. It's um, one of those stories where it takes um, a classic Victorian tale and puts a new spin on it. So um, you have Dracula having one essentially at the end of the book um, the Harkers and the others Van Helsing don't defeat him and he marries Queen Victoria and vampires begin to take over London. Uh, there's little brief references Dr Jekyll rocks up at one point um, a few other literary characters um, particularly from vampire literature um, there's mentions of if you know your vampire literature there's a few figures that crop up either in person or mentioned in passing Overall, I enjoyed it. Um, look, it's it's maybe not perfect, but it's a really enjoyable tale if you're into that that kind of retelling. So, uh, yeah, definitely check it out if if that's your sort of thing. Um, it's it's got a sort of not quite steampunk, but the sort of alternate Victorian feel about it. Other than that, I've pretty much been reading ebooks at the whole of June. Um, as usual, quite a few from NetGalley, plus um, I have a couple on my list that were sent by authors um, requesting review, and also a couple that are actually books in which one of my stories has appeared, um, anthologies, but I, I usually review the rest of the stories in the book, so I will do that too. So first up, Lonesome Lies Before Us, which was written by Don Lee, to which I prevaricated between three and a half and four stars, and in the end I gave it four. Uh, this is a story about an alt country singer and his travise in love and life. Um, what I liked about it was uh, it was a good story idea and the way his life kind of mirrors almost a country song um, worked very well. The only thing that let it down for me that made me hesitate a bit on the uh, awarding of the star rating was I didn't completely relate to the character. Um, there, there were two main characters, him and his sort of girlfriend. And they were nice, they were likeable enough, but I never felt that deep emotional connection with them. I, if something had happened to them by the end of the story, it probably wouldn't have worried me, you know, I wouldn't have been sobbing or anything like that. And I think that's what was missing, just that added depth of connection. But still, very enjoyable, and if you're someone who, who likes the, um, the music theme, um, if you're a musician yourself, or like reading stories about musicians, then it is a good one to check out. Uh, so that was a NetGalley one. Next up is one that I also got through NetGalley, and it's called Gears of Fate by Wilbert Stanton, um, to which I awarded three and a half stars. Now, this is a fantasy piece. Um, the best way to describe it is if all the gods in all the pantheons came together and lost a war against the Fae. And that's happened at the time the story starts. We get a sort of brief prologue introducing that idea. Then we move straight to the future where the gods and what's left of humanity are living in this floating world up in the sky. Uh, meanwhile, the Fae rule the earth. And we have an unlikely hero who meets a runaway fae princess and they join together to try to rally the gods and get them to come back and combat the fae and retake the earth. 
it's the first in a planned series I'm not sure if it's going to be a trilogy or longer but definitely there's more books coming the idea was awesome um, I loved the blend of mythology folklore there was a, a steampunk in there uh, so immediately when I saw this book listed it appealed to me and I enjoyed those elements in it again the only thing I found was sometimes the characters maybe didn't appeal to me as much as I would have liked as leads and the main thing was the plotting and the pacing uh, it was a very slow start I mean we we did spend a lot of time getting to know the world which was good and it, it didn't feel like info dumping it was nicely mixed into the story however after that we kind of reach a point where everything's been slow 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 and there's all these major plot lines that you think wow you know this is this is going to carry on into book two because they've got to do this and they've got to free this person and fix that but then suddenly 90% of it was all wrapped up within the last three or four chapters which kind of left me a bit disappointed it was like I'd had all this excitement and enthusiasm what was going to happen and then it was suddenly over and I mean, obviously there's a few things that have been left unresolved ready for book two but not as much as I thought there would be and I just think that was a slight mistake in in the pacing because it, it kind of just you sort of flopped at the end and you're like oh okay that and I, you know much of the action we were told there were these two major plot points and yet their resolution happened off page we're suddenly told it's happened the end um, so I'm hoping I, I'd read book two but I'd hope the pacing was just handled a little bit better the next one another net galley is the impossible views of the world by Lucy Ives and, and this is my first five star read there's a couple of them five star read for June uh, this is a contemporary novel with a sort of bit of mystery thrown in um, our main character works at a uh, art gallery museum um, she's gets embroiled in the disappearance of one of her co-workers and in some ways it's the mystery of her trying to find out what happened to Paul um, did he commit suicide was he murdered was he doing something at their workplace that no one knew about but at the same time it's also her discovering herself she's she's just in the middle of a divorce she's in her 30s she doesn't quite know where her career's going so it was kind of a, a self-discovery journey as much as it was a solving the murder or slash suicide it was an intriguing plot that kept me interested right the way through and the thing that really made me give this five stars though was the prose it was absolutely beautiful um i'm getting sick and tired of reading stories with these short sentences that are, seem to be written so that a five-year-old can understand them which seems to be the way publishing's going um we're constantly being told as writers to dumb down our prose you know you can't use this punctuation because readers won't like it and, um which i think is a bit unfair i'm sure there's plenty of very intelligent readers out there who can handle a semicolon but in any case that's a little rant for another time um what i loved about this book was the beautiful sentences really varied grammar lyrical descriptive and even if you didn't read it for the story just reading it for the prose is worthwhile next up i've got three books that i received free copies of because i am actually one of the authors involved in the works um so i just want to again just do a little disclaimer and say that my reviews of these books are not taking into account my own story i'm only basing my review on the others in the books um, and what i think about those and so that's what i want to share with you today so all three are lgbt mm mostly um bit of a bit of ff um stories so the first one beneath the layers uh, this was a call from nine star press for stories to do with cross-dressing um, so a really nice collection four stars um, I gave it all the stories were enjoyable reads um, the ones that stood out for me I've got a note here were CL um, Mr Peach, uh, Sydney Blackburn and Caitlin Ricci um, their stories particularly brought smiles to my face and um, very pleasant enjoyable reads captivating stories lovely characters uh, so if cross-dressing and with a bit of mm and everything thrown in as you'd expect is your thing then it's definitely one to check out um the next one was fairy tales slashed volume seven from less than three press uh, as the title suggests these are all fairy tales 
given a LGBT twist. Uh, in some cases they're clearly based on known fairy tales, in others they're just completely made up stories with a fairy tale feel. Um, again, four stars because it's a really nice collection. As always with anthologies, some stories resonated with me more than others. Um, that's always the case with these sort of works. Um, standout ones, Camellia Quinn, Keelan Ellis, Andrea Speed and Nicole Field. Um, they were my top picks from the book, ones I really enjoyed the most. Um, and then the last one in this category is the Sexy To Go Gay Romance. Um, this is a really eclectic collection. Um, the only uh, sort of request for the call was a gay romance story. So there's quite a mix, there's a bit of fantasy um, plus a lot of contemporary. And four stars, as I said, um, again for this one, standout stories by Dale Lowry, Ava Lafoy, um, Jodie Payne and Lee Elwood. Sorry, couldn't read my own writing for a minute there. I just scribbled this before I started the video. Uh, so that's a pretty standard uh, gay romance anthology. There's not a set theme. So if you want something that's a real mix and you get a bit of everything, then um, that's probably the one to go for out of the three for that. Okay, sorry about that. My camera wasn't happy that I'd left it just sitting there not touching it for a while and it decided to just turn itself off uh, in the middle of the video. So I hope I've spotted when it happened and I'm going to pick up at the right point so I can just splice the two together. But if there's a sudden weird jump in the video, you know what's happened. Uh, when I do the next one, I maybe have to do a, half the questions and then come back. We'll see. Anyway, um, I'll just pick up where I think we left off. Mr. Rochester by Sarah Shoemaker, uh, Annette Galley Reed, and the second of the three five star reads that I have this month to share with you. Uh, as you might expect from the title, this is a retelling essentially of Jane Eyre from Mr. Rochester's point of view. Uh, although, of course, the story starts well before he meets Jane. Uh, it's basically split into about three books, and you have his school days, his days as a young man when he's going to Jamaica, marrying Bertha, later going to uh, France and um, meeting the dancer and then finally Jane comes in in book three. Um, as such, there's going to be people that don't like this, um, obviously. There's going to be the diehard Jane Eyre fans who say, well, his character's changed. And it has. Uh, his character is not exactly the same as it is in Jane Eyre. However, I think that's unavoidable if you're going to write someone's backstory. Because although we get some information on things that have happened to him in Jane Eyre, writing it from his point of view in all that detail, his emotions of his childhood, um, his early adult life, it's giving you a different perspective. So when he does things later in the sort of Jane Eyre part of the story, you're seeing maybe where those decisions came from more than you do in the original story. So of course that makes him come across a little differently. However, it's, this is still a very enjoyable book. If you love the character, and I've often thought, I'd like to know a bit more about him, this is a great story. I think the choices that Shoemaker's made worked well. Um, prose is very readable. So if you just want to, if you just want to sit down book and you think, oh, Mr. Rochester, great character, then it, I think you'll enjoy it. Just, you've just got to put aside the inner critic that wants to compare it to Jane Eyre, I think is the issue with, and that's always the case with books such as these where they, take a different character's point of view or do a sequel like um, there was a sequel to Les Miserables um, called Cosette I think and I read it and I was so disappointed it was, I thought oh wow hear more about what happens to Cosette and Marius after the book but it wasn't that great um, but anyway this one I think does, does work and um, five star read and now we come to the other five star read the last of the three for this month which was the book of Broadway by Eric Broad uh, it's a non-fiction book listing um, the plays and musicals that he thinks have been the most influential on Broadway and it pretty much goes from 1900 up till the last few years, Hamilton. Um, this is a really enjoyable book. If you're a theatre fan, particularly a musical fan, it's definitely worth taking a look at. Of course there are going to be people moaning that their favourites weren't included. Um, I mean, I'm saved a bit because a lot of my favourites are European musicals and as such they wouldn't be relevant for a book about Broadway shows anyway. There's only one that I thought, why did he not include that? And that was Next to Normal, um, which was a musical, which if you haven't seen it, 
check it out, it's really great. Um, you can find bits of it on YouTube. Um, it's, I think it's a pretty important work. It, it won the Pulitzer, didn't it, I think? Um, and it had, it really gave something new, I think, so I'm surprised that wasn't included. Other than that, though, I thought all his picks were spot on. Um, most of my favourites are there. A few plays in particular that I hadn't heard of, which um, certainly in were interesting to read about. I liked that it was alphabetical because that kind of split the years up. So you'd have a 2011 musical next to a 1920s play. Um, I think if you'd read it through from the first produced one to the last, I don't think it would have worked as well. Because you would have been like, oh, well, this is old stuff, and this is new stuff, and this is stuff I know. Uh, so I, I quite liked that decision. I think that worked for him. Um, it's ba you basically get about two pages on each uh, show, a couple of pictures, a bit of information about its opening, uh, his commentary on it, um, and his thoughts, why he's chosen it essentially f as a seminal work. So any theatre fan would definitely enjoy this read. Um, I believe it was published before, and this is a more updated one. He's added a few new plays, changed a few out, so definitely worth a look. Um, we're coming towards the end. I've got four more, and these again are all ebook reads. Um, two of them are having a look here. Two of them were author review requests, and the other two come from NetGalley. So I'll do the two NetGalley ones first. Um, Alexander Hamilton's Revolution by Philip Thomas Tucker, four star read. Uh, non-fiction book. So Hamilton's obviously a pretty big subject these days thanks to the musical, which I haven't seen, um, I should point out. It is going to be showing somewhere that I'm going on holiday, so um, maybe, fingers crossed, perhaps I'll get to it. But obviously I've been interested, as many of you will know, in the American Revolution for a while, since the turn TV series first started. Um, I didn't know masses about Hamilton, I knew the basic story of his life. Um, what he did during the revolution and the famous duel and everything of course so it was interesting to learn a bit more in depth now obviously from the title um, his, his revolution as it would suggest um, the concentration of this book is mostly on the revolutionary years and his role as essentially Washington's chief of staff although the name didn't exist for that position at the time so they kind of gloss over, we hear a bit about his early days, how he ended up coming from the West Indies to America, but it, it, the focus is really the revolutionary years. So it's probably more, if you've got a bit of an idea about his history but want to learn in depth his involvement in the revolution, um, then this is probably a book for you. If you really want a complete overall look at his life, then you'd probably start with another biography first. But it was enjoyable. A little bit of repetition sometimes. I kind of felt that words and phrases like just kept repeating and sometimes information like I'm pretty sure we got told several things several times during the course of the book. But other than that, it was it was well written and, you know, not stodgy. It was quite easy reading. So I uh, wanted to check out if you're a history buff. And the last NetGalley one is an anthology called Equus. Now, interestingly enough, I actually submitted a work for this anthology, which wasn't accepted. But now I've read the anthology, I can see why, because I don't think my story really fit with the tone of the other ones that are included here. Uh, as the title would suggest, the theme is horses, and it can be anything from just standard horses to Pegasus, um, sleep near, unicorns. It's quite a mix, and the stories reflect that. Obviously, there's a strong fantasy push, though there's a bit of straighter contemporary with just a bit of magical realism as well. Um, this, this is a really interesting one. I'm giving it four stars. There were some really strong stories in here that I absolutely adored. However, there were one or two that really left me scratching my head. There was one that read like a promo for a novel because she sets up um, the author this amazing story premise and then it just suddenly ends. Okay, I am here to fill in the gap <laughs> between all these um, camera issues, depleted batteries, full SD cards, um, a little bit at the end of one book review and the review of another book got lost somewhere. <laughs> uh, the battery is now charging and in the meantime I thought I'd just finish off here with this little missing bit. 
Uh, so as I was saying, the story in Equus, it just suddenly ended. Um, and I, I didn't enjoy that. I think as an anthology, I don't want to feel like I have to go out and buy another book afterwards in order to read the rest of the story. Uh, I want a story that's got a clear beginning and end uh, that I can enjoy just as and of itself without having to go out and buy 20 million more books like when I finish the anthology. Um, for me that's not what an anthology should be about so uh, I did have a problem with that story uh, especially because although at first I was sort of thinking what's going on it did start to grow on me and so then when it suddenly stopped I was like oh, couldn't believe it. Uh, but anyway, the rest of the, um, that's the only one that did that, the rest of the stories were all complete stories and a really eclectic and imaginative mix, so um, if you like sort of magical realism and fantasy and if you love horses, it's a good good anthology to pick up, four star read for me. And the other one that kind of got cut off in the video thing was um, a book that I read following an author review request and this is Shattered Roses by Emma Parfit. Um, now this story is based on Beauty and the Beast, um, loosely. Uh, it's an interesting adaptation. It's very short, about 50 pages long um, in the PDF I read, and it's told from the viewpoint of a girl who goes into a nursing home and reads to this lady, this old lady, and hears her story about this duke she once knew and there were sort of curses and enchanted roses and things involved. I liked the premise, however I think I gave it uh, three and a half stars and the reason I couldn't give it more was it just felt too short. Um, we're getting the story from the girl's point of view, she's got a lot of stuff of her own going on in the background as well, and I just didn't feel there was enough of the Beauty and the Beast tale from this old lady. Um, I would have liked to have seen this story twice the length at least, and I would have liked to have had the scenes with this young girl, um, but then in between that had the chapters telling the story of the woman and the duke. Because I just felt that we didn't get enough of it. We just got these tiny little snippets um, and I, I wanted to know more about it because it, it wasn't a different take on Beauty and the Beast, an interesting one. I just think it needed more page time <laughs> if that's a, such a thing. I may have invented a term then, but we'll see. Um, needed more page time. To, to really tell it properly, it just I didn't really relate to the, either the girl or the the lady and the duke because I didn't get to know them well enough. So that that for me, I think there's definitely a novella there, uh, if not a full novel. Um, maybe you could get the girl's story to um, not mirror the ladies and the dukes, but have some bearing on it, and you could make this into a quite a long piece. I think Defin definitely a novella length to really do it justice. So um, that's that. I'm going to jump back to the <laughs> other video in the library just to finish off the final book. So I'll see you all in two seconds. You are seriously not going to believe this, but the SD card was full. Oh my goodness. Oh, this is like a nightmare videoing session. Uh, anyway, where was I? Death and Beauty. Finish quick, quick, quick. Um, yes, so Death and Beauty is a story of Baldur and Hell. It's an erotic tale, MF. Um, and it obviously draws on Norse mythology and it's sort of saying why is Baldur staying in hell? It's because he and hell fell in love and they thwarted Frigg's attempts to free him. So this is kind of a little spin-off world from her The Trickster's Love Us um, novella, um, longer piece, which I read a little while ago and mostly enjoyed. Um, I gave this one a slightly high star rating. There was, I had one problem with The Trickster's Lover and that was um, an element of the plot that didn't work um, because I, I happened to be a translator and I knew that what she translated wasn't possible, which you know was just a sticking point for me and stopped me giving that first book a high rating because otherwise it was a beautifully written book, great story idea. Um, so this one was good because there was nothing that sort of jarred me in the story. It's well written, it's sexy, um, and yeah, I mean I definitely always read more from this author. Um, so this one was four stars as I said. And so that was 13 books for June. I will be back again at the end of July with another update. Um, 
I'm just about back on track with my Goodreads goal, so we'll see how I'm going in a few more weeks. <laughs>